And we are live. Hello, people. It's Wednesday, so you know what that means. It's Woke Women Wednesday. We probably completely confuse you because you're used to seeing us at different times of the day. Senator Diane Wilkerson here with you this morning. I'm here at 11 every Wednesday for Woke Women Wednesday. I start always by saying thank you to the wonderful visionary women of Woke Women Radio, of WWOCRadio.com, Facebook Live, who had the vision to know how important it was almost now two years ago, right? Um, that we would need a, a vehicle to be able to get information to you in a timely fashion. And so every Wednesday at 11, I'm here. And then, at, you know, I open in the morning, bringing you all things, you know, black and, and COVID. And then at 8 p.m., um, uh, my fierce and fearless, this is my introduction always to you, Councilor Mejia. I, I say this every week, my fierce and fearless warrior, City Councilor Julia Mejia comes at eight. But this morning, she's my guest because so much is happening in the city, as I said, and I wanted to have her here to talk about uh, what's happening in Boston. And, and most importantly, after this roller coaster ride of, of local city politics for the last year, um, what is 2022 going to bring to the Boston City Council for you? and through you to the city of Boston, the residents, of, particularly our community of color, um, I bring to you all, good morning with the heartiest welcome, City Councilor Julia Mejia. Good morning, Councilor. Good morning, Senator Wilkinson. It's always great to be in your presence. Um, I know I can't believe it's been two years since we've had this um, outlet to engage and I'm so incredibly grateful to the woke women um, production team behind the scenes making sure that we That's always right. make it happen so excited um, for 2022 you know I, I think when when we first came into this office in 2020 the last thing that we thought that is that we were going to be hit with a global pandemic and racial and civil unrest and so for the most part, our first 24 months in office has really been about learning, learning our job, learning what the city is capable of doing and what the city refuses to do, um, and identifying ways that we can move the conversation forward through whatever means we were able to. And I think, you know, it was a growth mindset for me, and there was a lot of moments of learning. Um, so I'm really excited to take the lessons that we've learned um, to another level. You know, we, um, in our first term, we were able to pass four pieces of legislation. Um, we established a residential kitchens um, here where people could actually build their home, their home businesses um, and kitchens right out of their homes. And this was, everybody talks about the wealth gap, which we know the data, $8 for a black household and 240,000 for a white household. And so that data is old from 2015, but not much has changed. And so, our hope was through this ordinance is to really figure out how we can close that gap doing those little things. And those little things do make a big difference. And so we've um, heard from so many people from Dorchester, Roxbury, Mattapan, who are in the process now of going through uh, getting their um, permits so that they can function their businesses out of their homes. Uh, we also established a Black Men's Commission here in the city of Boston um, in partnership with former uh, Tito Jackson, Ron Bell, and, you know, Conan Harris, Thaddeus Miles, Lee Nays, James Mackey. I mean, a host of Black men who um, have been on the forefront on issues that were impacting our Black men and boys. Um, and through that collaboration, we're establishing a Black Men's Commission here in the city of Boston to address the issues, whether it's workforce development, housing, re-entry, you know, mental health. Um, Bishop Dickerson has always been um, sounding the alarm about how important it is for us to center mental health and wellness for our Black men and boys. And so I'm really excited about what that work is going to look like. We also worked alongside Councilor Arroyo and Campbell to establish a civilian review board. You know, we're going through the process now for those appointments. And so we're really excited about that. Um, and then most recently, we um, also are in the process of passing a literacy task force here in the city of Boston. Everybody talks about the school to prison pipeline, but no one's really looking at the social and emotional um, and mental well being of our students who are struggling to read and write. So they act up in class and they end up in DYS. No one's talking about the fact that our black and brown men are coming out of um, prison 
and many are struggling to read and write and don't know how to fill a job application, but we're talking about setting them up for success. And then we have a lot of adult learners who are who who have had interrupted education that are struggling to read and write and immigrants. And so that literacy task force, you know, our hope is to really tackle these issues. Um, and the last piece of legislation that we um, presented on the council that now is being piloted in the city is um, uh, alternatives to 911. Um, and that is being piloted. And I say all of those things because I know the question was, what do we have in store for 2022? Well, all of those things are gonna need funding, right? We're going to uh, utilize our um, political capital and organizing with our people to ensure that those pieces of legislation that we passed this year um, that are supported with financial um, backing to ensure the success of these uh, initiatives that we launched um, in 2021. So that's part of our advocacy is making sure that we um, go hard on those issues. And then looking ahead, um, for other, other initiatives, you know, I'm expected to be the chair of education. A lot of folks know that um, education was my ticket out of poverty. I was almost 20 by the time I graduated high school. You know, I dropped out, I went back. I juggled two to three jobs during the summer. And for me, you know, we keep having the same conversation in the education space. And the only thing that changes are the characters and the outfits that we're wearing. But the chronic disregard for our, our schools and our low-income communities remain the same. And so our hope is through this work that we'll be able to move real issues around equity and not just equity as a word, but equity so, as so I want to highlight for the folks who are listening and, and, and watching um, what Councillor just did and said. Most discussions with city councilors are, are about lofty goals, right? It's about kind of the things or issues they'd like to tackle. It is so rare to have um, uh, discussions with, with city councilors and have them talk about ordinances that they have passed because so much of our politics has become about the, um, the photo op in the picture and not enough about the work. And the one thing that I have the utmost and highest respect, and I talk about this um, all the time, is the, is, the, is the energy that you spend on action and, 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 and actual um, kind of the tangibles. So that list you just ran off, you know, for just kind of what's happened in the last year. And you didn't talk about what I think was one of the most extraordinary feats. And that is, um, uh, you know, both of us are connected to WWOC because they gave us this space. They give us space to talk about all things black, brown and COVID. And what I say every week is that that means we talk about everything, right? Because COVID has impacted and invaded every single aspect of our waking and sleeping lives. And so that means everything. We have been totally immersed in uh, education, tracking, tracing, testing, you know, vaccination, um, how to operate a school system in the middle of COVID. And one of the things that we uh, did in, in my role as, the, as one of the co-founders of the Black Boston COVID-19 Coalition was put the call out to our elected officials, city and state to say, you know, we have an opportunity to get our folks in um, to pass all of the delay and, and, and time that it was taking people to try to get even an appointment to get a, vac a vaccine. And I put that, we put that uh, word out to all of our elected saying that we are connected with the Reggie Lewis. We are able to facilitate, you know, 24, 48 hour access. And, and I, when I say all of our electeds, I mean electeds on the city and the state level. And um, there were a few, you know, who said, well, I'm, and we and, and we encouraged them to let their con constituents know. Uh, we got a few that sent us, to, you know, a couple, you know, Representative Holmes is funny because he is different in that way too. He started showing up at the Reggie. He was like the one person cab. He was driving his constituents back and forth from Mattapan and Hyde Park. But you uh, did something that um, I, I still, I talk about it to this day. Um, you set up a Google doc process and she, and Councilor Mejia connected, contacted all of the constituents that she's been working with anyway, the barbershops, the, the beauty salons that were struggling and trying to stay open. 
um, the, the the people you talked about who were doing looking to do uh, 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 catering and do food from their homes. And in uh, a three, two, three months time, she had 2,400 people who signed up and were making their way to the Reggie to get vaccinated. So the, the, the largest number that we saw from other electeds was like five, you know? Uh, I have five, I have four, I have six, maybe six. But she had, when I said 2,400, and I don't know if people heard that, let me say that again, that's 2,400 residents of Boston, mostly, well, I would say overwhelmingly, 99% uh, folk of color, Black, Latino, Cape Verde, Creole, Hispanic, and Latino. It was just amazing. And um, that's actually, that's how the system is supposed to work. That's the kind of work that electeds are privileged in, in a special place to be able to do. So I brag on you all the time about it, but we're not done because now we're in a surge again, counselor. So we're going to start all over. We're going to yeah. start all over again. And, and I know I mean, you're going to be there. Yeah, you know, and I have to say that, you know, the Black COVID Coalition really here in, in Boston set the stage for accountability um, in the early stages, right? You all were the first to sound the alarm that our people were not getting tested, that we didn't have the right resources or the education or the um, community engagement out in these streets. And so it was through your leadership that we really were able to get our folks vaccinated, right? And I think that I always look at this work as an inside outside game in terms of strategy is that we have to be super mindful and intentional about making sure that we continue to stay grounded um, and work in direct collaboration with those who are on the ground. And I think that what happens and what I also have learned in the last 24 months is that there is a disconnect. And that I always say, people say that you're my voice on the council. And I say, no, I'm not your voice. I'm your microphone. My job is to amplify your voice, right? That's and there's right. a difference, right, in terms of how people work. And I think that partnership, because when you reached out, we were like, wow, okay. We thought we were, we were so honored that you reached out to us and asked us for, for help in getting this out. And we also knew that we had a responsibility because there were a lot of folks, immigrants, black and brown um, residents um, and business owners who were afraid. And so having someone who that they can trust and because the information was coming from our office and because we had been working in deep partnership with them around other issues, they, they saw this as a sense of urgency and they got their employees, they got their clients, right. you know, uh, they got everyone uh, tapped in. And, you know, I think that within the first week or in the first two weeks, I think we, we, we were at like eight or 900 people. It, it like, was amazing. It was, it it was used just, to be amazing. And, and, and so I think that that is also a great example of what happens when you are an action oriented um, right. public servant, right? And so I like people to, that could learn from, from, from you and, and, you know, and all the while you're doing it, you keep talking about what is real. That is, you're still learning, you know, right? You're still listening. And so many people don't understand that it's never, you're never too late. Your Hira uh, uh, just uh, commented that um, we, she talked, she's talking about special ed and our whole school system. And I interrupted that you, and you were talking about the recap of 2021 and heading into 2022. So I want to get back to education because obviously for us, that is major. And if folks didn't know, uh, you are in fact in line and in, in line to be the chairperson of the committee on education. I know not only is that in your bandwidth, but it's in ours, clearly one of the most important issues for us. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about uh, tell me yeah. your thoughts on, on the school yeah. special ed. It's just yeah. a thought. I always so, say. I'm happy. Go ahead. I'm happy to know that Jahida's tuning in because when we think about special ed um, and navigating the education space, she is the poster child for that. She's been one of the fiercest voices out here holding the system accountable um, to our students. And so having grown, you know, I went to every single Boston public school, you know, my mom and I bounced from place to place while I was growing up. So Every school year, sometimes I'd be going to three different middle, you know, elementary schools and I've had to, you know, make new friends during the school year, which was really hard. And so 
I think it's important when you have those lived experiences because there are a lot of young people right now who are experiencing housing insecurity. And so that prevents you from accessing the curriculum. Then you have young people who are um, whose IEPs are not being honored. Um, when you go to an IEP meeting, the information is so technical that sometimes parents don't know what they're signing up for. They don't know how to advocate and or fight for those services, right? And then the city, the, the administration and the district gets a pass. And so for me, um, knowing what it's like to be a BPS graduate and a parent and someone who founded a nonprofit organization to mobilize parents, educators, and students, I believe that you know our office is well positioned to really tackle these conversations from a place of lived experience and those who are doing the work, the, our educators, our you know our guidance counselors, people who are front and center. And I think oftentimes decisions get made up here. And so I wanna really create a model where people are organizing and in collaboration. And so one of the things that I'm hoping to do, Senator Wilkinson, is that I wanna create um, a committee or appoint people to be part of our uh, committee. Now I know that that's, uh, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to put that as a council rule, but in my ideal world, you know, each committee should have at least, you know, a nine to 13 people who sit in deep collaboration in these committees to shape the agenda, to identify what are the policy goals, and then to work in collaboration to push right. that work forward. And oftentimes right. that's not how things get done. And so my hope is, is to recruit and, and create an education advisory committee that will work in deep partnership with our office um, to move the work forward. And then the other committee ship um, that I am, you know, I'm expected to hold is workforce development. I see workforce development and, and the intersection of education as one of the same, right? Um, you know, we have to build the pipeline. Everybody talks about that they don't have enough black and brown talent. I find right. that to be offensive. <laughs> That's right. And so in the workforce development space, you know, we're going to be really leaning in on a lot of issues around um, employment discrimination. There are people who are sitting in offices who have been in their positions with master's, master's degrees for nine to 10 years. And then they're training and um, supporting people who have just come in. Right. So there's a lot of issues around um, diversity. In, in the workforce here in the city of Boston. And we are well positioned to not only uncover that, but to do something about it. So through our workforce development efforts, we see a number of opportunities. And one thing that we did in this year's budget is we created a new line item for a workforce development project for 19 to 24 year olds. And we hope to target um, young people from Madison Park, young people who are transitioning out of DYS, foster care, and alternative high schools, right? Non-traditional right. learners. And so creating a pathway for this cohort of young people to get meaningful employment and not something that gets watered down, but to have a livable wage at, at 19. Um, Cause I think that that's gonna be a way for us to also address the displacement situation. So, you know, 2022 is really an opportunity to push the envelope and to go a little bit harder on some of the things that we have discovered over the last 24 months. And then the last um, committee ship that I'm going to be, I'm expected to chair is one that I, a new one that I created, which is government accountability, transparency and accessibility. And that committee, under that committee, we're going to have the post audit committee, which was um, chaired by um, Councilor Yancey. Uh, right. and, and so our hope is to bring that back to life but the accountability and transparency piece of it and the accessibility is really about accessibility is how people are navigating city contracts. Um, how easy is it for people to apply? You know, the information that comes out, I think about as information justice. Are people getting, are, are people getting information in real time? Accountability is like, how are we holding ourselves accountable to the data? Um, and the, the transparency is the data piece. Like I would like to really go in on data that already exists that will inform how we hold the city accountable to procurement, um, to a, a lot of the issues that we see in our Boston public schools around ELLs, um, special education. Like that committee is going to be laser focused 
on uncovering these issues and more importantly, doing something about it. So I'm you really know, excited. Yeah. People think, uh, I think so many people think that it's always about we need more money. And one of the things that I learned in my uh, time at the State House that sometimes it's more important to figure out what you're doing with the money you got. That's right. And so I say that specifically about the Boston public school system because they have been um, especially blessed in this last year with money coming from the feds, money coming from the state. Um, and, and I am really, really, really looking forward to having um, you there in 2022 to find out what are we doing with it? Because, because um, you know, like you hire, I know what we're not doing with it. That's right. You know, I know that in spite of the fact that many of our, well, the majority of our children in BPS spent um, from March of 2020 till the fall of 2021, at least in at home in isolation. Yeah. And That's when right. you think about how we started, right? So the, you know, I know the stats, I can run them off my top of my head, you know, 75% of the black boys, something like 60% of the Latino boys in our BPS are labeled and identified as special ed. So those were, though, and, and I think it's 25 and heading on 30% for the girls. Think about what that must have been like, because we know adults who didn't do very well in that isolation, right? Yeah. So yeah. they were home for all that time. No one putting eyes on them, no professionals. Um, the BPS has dismantled their um, school psych program, uh, which is really different from having social workers, because social workers and psychologists are two very different models in profession. So they were they were isolated. Um, they when we finally got ready in 2021 in the fall to bring students back to school, there clearly was no plan to deal with the mental health and the reality of what has you know what happened, what what impact that isolation had on already vulnerable and fragile you know psyches. And they just yeah. walked them back in. And, we, you know, yeah. some I used to say and with a mask. Now I'm learning that not everybody even got a mask. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. counselor, your your presence in that space is, um, you know, I say legitimate. I, here comes the boss. Here comes the chair. It's so, so, so exciting to me because yeah. I know that you're going to be um, uh, asking the questions and demanding the, the answers. Where does BPS spend all that darn money? Yeah. Right? You know, I, I, I think, I think you're my. I always talk about how our lived experience really informs the things that we pursue, and so mental health is one of the things that our office goes really hard around. And so, we created a, a new program. I mean, how, some of the work that we do is policy, and some of the work that we do is programming in our office. So we we partnered up with clinicians of color, and we created a mental health ambassadors program for young people in the city of Boston. And yeah. on December the 12th, they're gonna be finishing their training. They are being trained as peer uh, advised, peer leaders and um, from different schools across the city. And they are learning about their own triggers and how to help support um, and identify uh, issues that are bubbling up to the top for their peers and then connecting their peers to the support services that they need. So. A program as simple as that, um, I'm really excited about because we see this as an opportunity for young people to think about mental health and make it sexy, right? And make it fun and make it engaging and, and remove some of the stigma around it. And so the young people who graduate from this program are going to be getting um, stipends uh, uh, starting in January to work with our office to inform the policies, the protocols, and the procedures that they want to see in their schools right. to support their mental health and wellness. And so that's something that I hope we're doing it as a pilot, but it's it's really about addressing these issues because I'm not gonna wait for people to do what's, what is needed for our kids. I'm going, you know, the way that I function is I'm going to I'm going to figure it out and I'm going to make it happen with or without the support of, of, of folks who are going to validate why this should happen. And we did that program with barbershops and hair salons this past summer. They graduated. Now, basically, while you're getting your hair done, you're getting your head fixed. And these barbershops and hair salon owners 
and their employees are connecting their clients to the support services that they need um, when they are expressing the issues that they're experiencing at home or at work. And so it's little things like that that our office is doing to address the mental health crisis because that's going to be the next global pandemic. No one's really, I mean, people are talking about mental health, but we need to get ahead of it in a way that's going to address the Very residual nice. impact that COVID has had on pe- people. People have lost loved ones and have grieved in silence and alone. You know, people ha- are experiencing um, food insecurity, housing instability, all of that. Economic in- instability. Ex- economic, economic, all of that. And the reason why we created the mental health program for the barbershops and hair salon owners is because we heard um, from them during another initiative that we had launched that they were so concerned about their financial well-being that they worked so hard at building their business and that they were so afraid to lose it that they didn't know that they felt paralyzed. And it was that piece of information that inspired us to create this program. And now we're going to be launching this program with the MBTA bus drivers um, in, in, in February. So we're busy. Yeah. Well, Counselor, one of the things that I want to ask you about is Kind of, you must have, you must think a lot about this new council that you're stepping into city hall with in in January. It's going to look a little different, I'd say, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm excited. You know, I think being a first term counselor in 2020, I, I didn't know what I was walking into, and I, I feel like we had so many missed opportunities to really move in deep collaboration, mainly because of just COVID and we were all hands on deck. But I really felt that as a, as a collective, as a city as a whole, which is what I'm really hoping for this year is that everybody recognizes that this is not the Hunger Games. We should not be pitting district against district and that we should be working in true collaboration so that we see our constituents, regardless of what district we represent, accountable to the whole, right? right. And, right. I, and I'm really encouraged um, by this. This week, actually, our office is hosting a systems building and relationships building retreat for the incoming class. Um, and we're going to be sharing our best practices, you know, how to navigate um, this work uh, so that we can set up the new incoming class up for success. And we're inviting Um, previous counselors and current counselors to come in and share rules of engagement, right? Because you don't come into this office knowing what to do. And so I know it was really difficult for us. So we want to make sure that we do everything in our power to set up the next class for success so that we're building upon our collective and not, you know, and working with very intentionality around moving the work forward. So, so 2022, looks to be just as busy and, and hectic as 21. We have, uh, let's say you, you, so you all are going to be doing redistricting. You all are going to be focusing on um, the home rule petition for an elected school committee. You're going to be um, uh, overseeing uh, decisions on what to do with $500 million in COVID recovery money. You're going to be uh, seeing overseeing uh, the discussion of what to do with the city of Boston's infrastructure money, which is going to be hitting, you know, our coffers soon. Um, And you're going to be overseeing what to do with the city of Boston's ARPA money that they're about to get the COVID recovery from the Commonwealth and the bill that just passed there. And so, you know, it's a watchdog function. It is so important because here's, here's what I, I think is the, one of the biggest challenges and whether in school department is one of those departments that's been Kind of off in the in the in the in the frontier and allowed to to do what they do without much oversight. But when you really think of the amount of money that the city of Boston is dishing out in every way, with the city of Boston and then the school committee on top of that, and even BPDA, you know, you gotta wonder, you know, whether a different strategy on how we spend. Um, could very well result in in being able to change lives for so many of the residents who are struggling every day. With you know spending that kind of money, we ought to be able to see it clearer. And so, just you know, the city council is a huge 
um, factor in our yeah. ability to do that. Yeah, and I and I believe that the new committee that I'm expected to chair, uh, which is we created it because we wanted to be super intentional about the how we move. It's accountability, transparency, and accessibility. Yeah. And I think that you know having the post audit there, really being intentional about communication and, and engagement because that we need to have these processes in place. Um, I think it's going to be a vital part of that puzzle to ensure that we're holding ourselves accountable uh, to what matters and that we're investing, right? This, when I, it's, it's about investment. And I think that that's the other thing is that we always lead with our deficits. And so I really want to really start thinking how we shift the narrative. There are a lot of assets in our community. And if we don't start leading with those assets, it's always going to feel like people are doing things for us, not with us. And there's a lot of power in the people. And I think that it's going to be on our community That's to right. really uh, push what it is that they want us to fight for. And I think that that collective power building is the strategy that we're going to need to do just that. Well, I know I speak for many when I say that knowing that you're going to be there and be a part of it um, is giving us a lot of hope and, um, and excitement. And we wanna be able to continue to support what you're doing. I, I just wanna mention a few things because you know, you know, you do it every Wednesday night as well. The time goes so quickly, right? So yep. you can see for the folks who are listening and what, well, if you're listening, you can't see it. If you're watching, you can. The little tag at the bottom uh, uh, that's rolling on uh, next week. In fact, let me just put my glasses on so I can, I don't want to get this wrong. The yeah. Urban League of Roxbury, we both, Urban League of Roxbury. So on Thursday, which is going to be a week from tomorrow, from at two o'clock, I think it's gonna go on for two hours, or at least as long as they last. The Urban League, which is loaded, located right down in Nubian Square, across from the, um, the courthouse, is going to be giving out boxes of masks. Why is this important? Because it's December. And you know, we know, I know, it's, it doesn't matter what I tell you, you all are gonna have your holiday. You're gonna gather, you're gonna to wanna to be around your family, and we just wanna want you to be safe. So you'll be able to get boxes of masks, so anybody and everybody just get it. They'll hand it, go, it's no fuss, no muss, so that you will have them over the holiday. So when people visit your house, you'll be able to hand them a mask because if you're gonna be inside gathering, we have to be mindful about the Delta variant. We gotta be mindful about Omicron. Uh, we gotta be mindful about the surge. Yesterday, we had 51 deaths in Massachusetts. We haven't had 50 plus deaths since last year. And so I know, this is not just talking at height, this is real. This is real. So we got to do what we need to do. The city is just announced their COVID-19 advisory committee on Monday. And starting next week, they're going to be distributing 20,000 home testing kits. So folks who have had a challenge trying to get a test will be setting up different sites around Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, um, where people can come, see, uh, get tested, and get a demonstration on how to do the test yourself. You'll get a box. You can get a box free testing. If you try to buy them, you can't find them, but they are rapid kit test. Uh, you'll get a, a test. Each test has two. Each box has two tests in the box. And we want to just make sure that you stay safe and stay on, on, on top of this. And so thank you to the council. Thank you to Mayor Wu. Thank you to their new public health commissioner, Dr. Ojukutu, who has been just on fire and, um, and, and running to make sure that we stay ahead of this. We have to. Our, we have one job, one goal, and that is to save lives. And right. I thank you, Counselor, for your role in helping to do that because it's been major. I'm praying for you in 2022, excited about what's to come because yeah. I know that you're going to bring it. Yeah. And I also want to remind everybody that tonight, um, just for one night only, <laughs> I'm going to be coming on um, to reactivate my Woke Women Wednesdays at 8 p.m. And you're going to be my guest. So make sure that if folks tune in at 8 tonight. Uh, well, I'll be interviewing you. Um, <laughs> and so make sure that you tune in 8 o'clock. Um, we got a and, lot to share. We got yeah. a lot to share because there's a lot going on. So we're going to turn right. to people. I let you, you go today. She's going to interview me this evening. But we're always yeah. talking about our black and brown community. Uh, and like I said, the love we have for you. 
and just figuring out ways to make things better, keep people alive, keep people healthy, um, uh, provide the food and address housing and address the economic uh, voice that we've been dealing with. And I think that we all ought to be optimistic about 2022. So um, we'll be back next week. Yes. I thank you. I'm going to see you tonight. Councilor yeah. McNeil is going to see you tonight. But until then, just stay woke. WWOCradio.com, Facebook Live, signing on. Bye-bye. Bye. You know, I got to figure out how.